The date was October 5th of the year 2006 of the Gregorian calendar. The Sunrise Production House had just aired their first episode of Code Geass, a political drama with a supernatural twist. The production studio had taken a chance on this new mecha series, hoping that it would grow into a franchise like Mobile Suit Gundam or Love Live, both being cash cows that would fill the coffers for years. Hello everyone and welcome to the Gumpla Network. I'm the Spicer and today we'll be taking a look at one of my favorite anime of all time, Code Geass. Before I try my hardest to be unbiased in this video, allow me to be super biased and tell you about our sponsor today, the Gumpla Network Teespring Store. That's right, our Teespring Store is going to have you covered for any weather or climate you may live in. We've got t-shirts for hot weather, sweaters and hoodies for cold weather, we've got stickers to make you look cool, and we have mugs for hot and warm drinks. We even have our mascot Network Chan appearing on a couple of the sweaters. Be sure to check out that link in the description below, and if you scroll down just a little bit, you should see a preview of some of the stuff we have. Now to Code Geass. I'll get this out of the way early to avoid me ranting about my love of the show for the next billion years. Code Geass is one of the few shows that consistently will make me cry either out of joy or sadness. It's interesting, it's thrilling, and it's emotional when it needs to be. At least for now, we're not here to talk about those specific moments, you're here for the title. Is the first season of Code Geass Gundam for a new generation? Well, I absolutely believe so, and allow me the next 15-ish minutes to explain to you why. I've broken this down into four sections, or turns, to fit the Code Geass naming conventions. I think Code Geass is, at least in the first season, a new Mobile Suit Gundam, and when I say that, I don't mean the whole franchise, I literally mean the 1979 Mobile Suit Gundam, or by extension, the movie trilogy that's pretty much just a re-edit and slight improvement, visually speaking. So that is it, nothing else in Gundam, I just literally mean that specific piece of content. But first we're going to delve into the world building of both series, taking kind of an alternative history approach, in some cases for both. Next we'll look at the themes the show uses to tell us the story. Third, we'll take a look at a few of the key characters, and lastly, we'll talk about the main men, Goro Tanagachi and Yoshiki Tomino. Also, of course, light spoilers for both. <laughs> I guess technically you've been warned. The world of Code Geass is interesting, as it's an alternative history story that splinters off around the rule of Queen Elizabeth I between 1558 and 1603. While we don't get a lot of this information in the series, we do get little bits through Lelouch's classes that help spur our curiosity and is what drove me to the wiki many times. The main difference is that while our real world Queen Elizabeth would die without an heir, Code Geass's Queen Lizzie doesn't, but no one's sure who the father is, so there's no acting king. Well, there is a regent and one of the three possible fathers ends up being a big power player, the important part is the new King Henry IX's rule is considered to be the golden era of the Tudor dynasty instead of the end of it, like our Queen Elizabeth. Now honestly, not a lot changes for 200 years, at least that we can tell, but what we do know is that this is the age of revolution in universe. In a really quick way, America loses our war of independence. and Queen Elizabeth III loses her war against Napoleon, meaning that she gets kicked off the British Isles. Long story short, the new capital of the British Empire is now on the eastern seaboard of the United States. If we fast forward a little bit past that though, we have British imperialism mixed with manifest destiny, meaning the new Britannian Empire would control all of North and South America, a ton of islands, and New Zealand all before the start of Code Geass. Now, once Code Geass starts, they also have control of Japan and parts of Southeast Asia. In a way, this world could be proto-Gundam since what we see at the end of Code Geass in the United Federation of Nations is pretty similar to the Federation. So this could all be before what happens in Gundam. Now if we fast forward in the Code Geass timeline a little bit, space colonies don't sound too far off so they could technically kind of work in a similar fashion. 
Now, of course, you know, canonically, these are not tied together anyway, but from a storytelling standpoint and from an alternative history take, both of these work very well in the same way. And while it's kind of up for debate depending on who you ask as to whether Mobile Suit Gundam is alternative history, as there are a lot of different points that really could make it alternative history, Mobile Suit Gundam is a story that feels grounded in real-world sensibilities regardless. The world of Gundam provides us with the utopia or dystopia that we've heard political leaders talk about for decades. Being a global community, ending all war, coming together as humanity. All of that. Now, both of these worlds would show progress in the real world as well. For Gundam, it started the whole real robot subgenre, allowing for more mecha shows to take on darker themes. For Code Geass, it would take the more grounded alternative reality route feeling much darker than what was airing at the time. For instance, if we take 1978, the year before Gundam would air, we had three super robot shows flash across the screen in Japan. Invincible Steel Man Daitarn 3, Tonosha Daimos, and Ucha Majin Daikindo. And fun fact, Invincible Steel Man Daitarn 3 was Tomino's project before Gundam. Gundam would come out and change the world of mecha shows and how they were done, departing greatly from the previous year's offerings. Conversely, in 2005, the year before Code Geass would air, we saw Full Metal Panic, Ureka 7, and Gunnex Sword. Fun fact part 2, Gunnex Sword was Tanagachi's project before Code Geass. Code Geass would take a little bit of all three of those but would provide a fuller, richer world than what Mecha had usually seen. Well, not quite one-to-one, -one, of course. Following R1, or the first season of Code Geass's release, we would see similar worlds come out of things like Bakano, a certain magical index, and Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. Yes, I know all those are different genres, and yes, they are, in some instances, adaptations, which changes things a lot, but what was important is that Code Geass' success helped show people that general audiences could invest themselves in these worlds enough without going overboard. Even if we go past those examples and talk about the hit animes of today, Attack on Titan is a great example of a sprawling world that we don't get introduced to very quickly. If you've caught up with Attack on Titan, you know what I mean. While both Mobile Suit Gundam and Code Geass are complex stories, there are a few consistent themes we can see artfully portrayed in both. Well, pain, suffering, and trauma are all present in a big way, it's more of the subtle themes like compassion, future, and redemption that help set the shows apart. Mobile Suit Gundam has always been celebrated for its portrayal of Xeon, making them such a sympathetic bad guy that it's hard not to root for him sometimes. Showing figures like Rumbaral or even the nameless Xeon pilots that helped the lost mother and child really helps give us a sense as an audience that the people of Xeon are real-life people. They're people who have feelings. And all of these acts build up to give us that sense of depth or that sense of realism out of the people of Xeon. This is all a far cry from the super robot monsters of the era. In terms of Code Geass, we would get Princess Euphemia, one of the kindest and most compassionate characters in the whole show. They make a big deal of Euphemia, not just because of her relationships with Lelouch and Suzaku, but also she makes us question, is Britannia that bad? Putting us in Lelouch's shoes whenever we see Euphemia really helps bring to light his conflict and the compassion that Britannians can show. While Gundam is less heavy-handed in its desire for a better future, we do get to end the series on a hopeful note, giving assistance that everything is okay and all of the supporting cast that survived will go on to do things after the war. Now, it does more than just this though. For instance, if we look at Bright's interactions with Mirai, we get to see a little bit of a different story. While these interactions aren't the most noticeable, even shows the supporting cast of the series have plans, and they want to go on to do things after the war. It helps Mobile Suit Gundam feel like not the end of the existence of these characters, but just a stepping stone. Code Geass is 
a lot more heavy-handed in its portrayal of wanting a future, even having Lelouch at certain points referencing leaving his old life behind in pursuit of a better future. Oddly enough, that sounds a lot like Michael from Gun X Sword, who conveniently is also voiced by Johnny Young Bosch in English. This desire or drive for a future helps push these shows into franchise territory, giving us a reason to want to see these characters in action again. While it still would have been cool to see Bright show back up in Zeta regardless, it meant so much more knowing that he's a family man struggling between protecting his family from the Titans and doing what he feels is right. This is part of why Bright's presence throughout Zeta and Double Zeta means so much more than Amaro's. You would think the one-year war hero would have a little more to look forward to, but Zeta goes out of its way to make sure we know that's not the case. When we first see Amaro in Zeta, we learn from Frau that everyone's kind of moved on while Amaro is hiding at a flight school. And while it's not to make light of his trauma, we do even get to the point where the greatest mobile suit pilot of all time, Katz, tells Amaro off for this. Kogias leaves characters like that somewhat more behind for more future-focused narrative, but they do really go out of their way to show a contrast between the Black Knights as a group fighting for the future versus some other groups fighting for the past. Lastly, we have Redemption. Amuro's redemption helps us as an audience track his growth, from becoming more serious after uh, Ryu's death to returning the Gundam after deserting the White Base. We get to see Amuro's natural instinct to avoid conflict be superseded by his desire to protect his friends and do his part in a war that he didn't want to be a part of. Lelouch's redemptions largely do come in R2, but we do see him redeem himself for the lies he tells to Nunnally, or at least he's building the framework to do so. He works to ensure she's protected, only to have her stolen from his grip. Lelouch knows how much being Zero is going to hurt Nunnally, so he wants to make sure that when the dust settles, he, in his typical Lelouch fashion, can lay out a logical argument for those actions. A more Lelouch-centric redemption is his own redemption during the hotel jacking. Lelouch's last run-in with Cornelia in Saitama left him shaken, wondering if he could even beat the goddess of victory and the spearhead of the Empire. However, pulling off this stunning rescue and the most cunning of ways shows Cornelia that he is a force to be reckoned with and helps him build his self-esteem. Speaking of the Goddess of Victory and the Spearhead of the Empire, it's characters like Princess Cornelia and Sir Guilford that make the background of this universe so interesting. A Mobile Suit Gundam comparison would be the likes of the Zobby family. Getting cuts of Girin and Daegwen's conversations or seeing Daegwen mourn Garma's death gives us a similar look at the opposing side, the other, the opposition. Taking that extra step and making these bad guys into people is more than just showing a few good people on either side. It's about making these side characters relatable. Sure, no one's out here rooting for Giren, but Daegwen has these realizations after his ambitions have been filled that maybe he hasn't done the best thing and we see a man that's conflicted and hollow by the end of the series. We get to see a lot more out of Cornelia and Guilford in R1 though, and while we know them as the bad guys, we also see that that's complicated. On the other end of the spectrum we have Garma and Yuffie. Both are shown to be more compassionate members of their family, trying to do what they feel is the right thing while being treated as a figurehead. While well, Yuffie goes against the grain a lot more, the betrayals that both of these characters face leaves the audience very sympathetic to them and their cause. Now of course we can't talk about characters without looking at Lelouch, Sezaku, Amuro, and Char. While the roles are somewhat reversed, the inclusion of these foils helps keep the story going. Lelouch would be nearly unstoppable without Sezaku to spoil his plans, and much like Char would have been a national hero, for capturing the Gundam had Amuro not stomped him the many times he did. Not only do these characters play well off each other, but reversing these roles makes a lot more sense for 2006. To 
kind of go off on a little tangent here, back in 1979, Japan was still in its economic heyday. Well, not in the high increase era, the steady increase era of the 70s and 80s meant that the system seemed to be working well enough. Sure, there were other problems, but generally, the better the economic markers for a country are, the higher the standard of living is for that population. The worries of bureaucratic bloat were real, but they were not nearly as prevalent as they were in 2006. You see, leading up to Code Geass coming out in 2006, we had seen nearly a decade of policy mismanagement fail to control inflation and speculation in the country. Well, this may not be directly tied into either series, it does give us context, for anyone living outside of Japan at least, for why this role reversal makes so much more sense. Amuro working with and eventually for the Earth Federation seemed to be a good idea in the best interest of his friends, while the Xeon Rebellion was framed as kind of the bad side. Conversely, Lelouch is the direct instigator of the Rebellion in Code Geass, believing the system is too corrupt and flawed to be reformed. Changing these perspectives from working with the power to fighting against it is something that makes a little more sense with that context in mind. Aside from these archetypes and roles, Lelouch and Suzaku having a friendship helps shepherd a similar connection that we would eventually get with Amaro and Shar. Fast tracking this type of connection helps us understand what the characters' reactions would be even if we're not there to see it. Even if we don't see them directly, we know that Suzaku's going to be really upset when he learns that Lelouch has done something less than wholesome. Lastly, we have the legends themselves, Yoshiyuki Tomino and Goro Tanagachi. Both men had worked on projects directly preceding Mobile Suit Gundam and Code Geass, with Tomino heading up Invincible Superman Zambot 3 in 1977, and Invincible Steel Man Daitarn 3 in 1978. Tanagachi would helm s Cried in 2001 and then Gunnex Sword in 2005. And yes, watching Gun X Sword for the last video prompted me to rewatch Code Geass as it had been a couple of years since I had seen it and the vibes are really similar. While all of these prior works would do okay, none of them would be the hit of Mobile Suit Gundam or Code Geass. And yes, I know technically the original Mobile Suit Gundam wasn't a hit, but the recut compilation movies, which were pretty much the same content, would launch Gundam to its current fame and fortune, so I'm counting that. Both would go on to spawn a franchise giving rise to the real robot subgenre. Gundam created Real Robot back in the 1970s, and Code Geass would somewhat revitalize it in 2006. While there had been a few Real Robot style shows in Full Metal Panic and kind of Ureka 7, even though Ureka 7 gets really close to that edge of Super Robot, neither of those series had hit like Evangelion did back in its day. They were not the economic powerhouse that was Evangelion. Full Metal Panic would go on to have a sequel series and then a nearly 10 year gap between its second season, the Second Raid, and Invisible Victory that came out not too long ago. And Ureka 7's mini spin-offs have been less than stellar, unfortunately. While I did like them, they were not very well received most of the time. Code Geass would provide Real Robot in a niche again. It would do kind of what Gundam did and worked something in that era. And while other things would pop up, like Full Metal Panic, Full Metal Panic would not really go on to spawn a lot outside of that. Code Geass would have its second season R2 air very shortly after, and then the OVA series Akito the Exiled would continue on until the movie Lelouch of the Rebellion would come out. Well, there are of course different directing styles, different art styles, different storytelling methods used, Yoshiyuki Tomino and Goro Tanagachi were in somewhat similar situations and knew that they wanted to tell these stories in an era where that might not be all that popular. For Tomino having no real reference to go off of and Tanagachi seeing that the real robot shows of the era were not doing gangbusters, unfortunately. Luckily enough for both of them, Sunrise liked both and would continue using both franchises well into the future. 
And that's why I think Code Geass is kind of the new generation Gundam. Well, you had things like Gundam Seed come out, and while well, they were really popular in Japan, they were divisive elsewhere, and I think this is somewhat due to the fact that they didn't recontextualize Gundam. You see, Gundam was important in its time because it was different, and retelling that story, well, is not bad, and I like Gundam Seed quite a bit, missed the point. Sure, they did try to make some tweaks to Kira, he is still largely kind of Amuro with just a lot better plot armor. Conversely, Code Geass would actually take big strides in going the other way, making Lelouch this anti-hero and really leaning into that. And while that's not one-to-one -to, -one to Gundam, of course, it does help provide real robots something else. If we kind of talk about the previous things of the era, you know, Full Metal Panic was a very similar style of someone being part of a system and working for the betterment of the country or of the organization. And Eureka 7, well, it was kind of this rebel band group. They weren't trying to overthrow a government. They weren't mad at the government for policy reasons a lot of the time. Sure, the whole, like, I think genocide thing happened in Eureka 7, if I remember correctly. But generally speaking, we don't get a lot of that, and it's sold as air skateboarding robots. Code Geass would allow us that deeper dive and that darker vibe that we got from Code or from Mobile Suit Gundam and would provide us something to dive into and throw our money at. Well, Code Geass is of course not the powerhouse that Bandai would love as much as Mobile Suit Gundam is. They do have a lot of different merchandise and have really been popular even going into the second season of Code Geass, the Keto the Exec Exiled OVAs, and the new movie that came out, I think, last year or the year before. With a lot of different things in the In Action Offshoot line, the Robot Damashi line, the Bandai model kits, a plethora of anime figures, and so on, Code Geass, I do believe, will eventually get to similar to Gundam status, if not very close to it. Anyway, those are my thoughts, as biased as they may be, on Code Geass. In the comments down below, let me know what you think of these ideas. Am I crazy, or do you think I have a point? If you love Code Geass, also tell me, because I love Code Geass. Just saying. Leave a like if you like Code Geass, I guess. But other than that, friends, thank you for watching. Stay safe, stay tuned, and keep on building.